Thank you for coming to um, my talk on Pivotroot for BSD. Um, it just occurred to me this morning that this is my second talk in a BSD conference only. Um, the first one was seven years ago and this happens to be the second part of that talk. <laughs> in between I was working on RAM disk file systems, small systems, did a number of tutorials and um, also investigated NetGraph on FreeBSD. I've worked a lot on FreeBSD and I have a business that also manages uh, FreeBSD systems for my customers. And recently, about a year and a half ago, I then became a member of the, the NetBSD Foundation because I ha actually started moving over and looked at some of their code and was very, um, I learned a lot from it. And then I figured, okay, let's do something more in that area. So it's actually quite nice to compare. And I urge everybody to try to do this. And I've also given a tutorial in comparing the two in Japan, but I noticed that the interest was not that high. It was a bit strange. The NetBSD people wanted to see the NetBSD stuff, and the FreeBSD people wanted to see the FreeBSD stuff, but the, the comparison was not what the people were expecting. So here I'll be showing you Bifferroot, which I've implemented in NetBSD, but I plan to also port it to FreeBSD. So it's a very simple structure of my presentation. It'll first show, tell you what, what problem it solves, what it is actually. And then uh, I will present, how, I'll show you how it, how it solves it. And then I will talk about the implementation. So I've noticed, I've been talking about pivot root for ages because it was the end of the other talk I gave, and people keep asking, well, are you going to do this? Are you going to do this every now and then? And I said, well, there's not that much interest. But I noticed also that there was also misconceptions, so I'm going to tell you what it isn't first, just so you understand the difference. And then I'll show you how it runs, and then, um, of course, show you on the command line. So most people say, oh, well, it's just true, isn't it? Don't we have that? Well, it is something like Truth, but it's not just for one process, it's for the whole system. So Truth obviously puts a process into a different route, and from there on, all the sub-processes are in that route. But it's not that. Init Truth gets closer to it. Init Truth is a mechanism where the first process of a Unix, um, when it boots, goes into a different root file system than you would have in the beginning. This actually is a workaround for not having pivot root because um, when you boot into a system with a RAM disk, for example, you then have init already running and it's stuck there. So init root is a little syscontrol or can if it's in FreeBSD, and that would then tell init truth into this other file system which will be there at the time you, you're doing it, and from then on all the other processes, of course on a PID1 will be in that new route. So you've actually pivoted into the other uh, route that you've prepared, and you can say in a way that's the pivot. But the problem is you're doing this at boot time, and that's it, because you, once you start in it, that's where you are. Now, people sometimes say, well, it's also, you know, jails. It's also changing everything. The route becomes something new, and you have a new uh, network stack, and uh, some user in a jail doesn't even realize that there's an upper root, super root above. So, well, it's not that either. So, the question is, what is it? And I think the best way to understand what it is is to uh, look at uh, how you would how look at the file system structure and see what you want to do. So, obviously, we have the root node where we hang off our file systems, and we always have the root file system, at least on small systems, we only have that. And that file system will then have um, somewhere down the line a directory, which for these presentation I'll always call new root. It's a directory on the root file system. And on there you will then mount another file system. So did you notice it covered the, the directory, the node, and this is actually a bit of the complication we'll see later. It covers that, and you have the new root. 
Now the new route obviously should have very much the same infrastructure they have on the other route, so if you want to make that the new route, everything is where you expect it to be. Slash bin, slash s bin, bar, and everything else. Then under, in, in that file system, you will have a directory called put old. Just a directory, nothing mounted there. And now you want to pivot. So what do you do when you pivot? You actually just simply move that and you're done, right? So not very hard, you would think. There's the only thing though, now root is in the middle, it's not on the top anymore, so you have to relabel them. So now you have the end state where the new root has become the root of your running system and the old root is on put old, where you then can go and clean it up. I mean, you usually want to get rid of the old root, that's why you're pivoting away from it and you still have it under your new root to do things to it before you can unmount it. So. We look at it once more quickly. And this is, I think, where the name comes from, because it's a, quite an old name. And I'll show you on the command line how that looks like. So on an MPSD system, we usually have WD0, WD1 um, devices. And uh, on a small system where you only have root and everything's in the root, this would look something like that. And Here's a copy of root on the second disk, and I happen to have it mounted on new root. So we're talking about the system call, but obviously we have to have a user space program to call it. So this is a user space program, which for all practice purposes, we can call pivot root. We can call it something else. I'll come to that later. And we say, well, my new root is on the mount point new root, and the old one will be on put old. I'm using these word, these names because it's traditionally called like that in the system call I'll get to. When you do this, you get what you expect. You, it's flipped. WD1 is now root. It's on the um, list, on the mount list, on top, on, because you want root to be first on the list, it's important and WD0 is on put all, reachable from root. So you can still do things like clean it up. So the question is, does it run? It didn't run for a long time, but it does now. So I was gonna show you quickly. And I'll be showing another demo later on, a bit more sophisticated. I just wanted to show you, see it, to, to show you how it runs. So I'm running um, a virtual box here. Oh, I see. I'm running a virtual box here with um, two disks, same size, two adapters so I can go to the outside. I can lock in from the inside. It's running NetBSD head. And um, yeah, here you can see. It's running um, head, and um, it's a kernel loadable module, so I have to uh, first load the, um, the module into... It's a bit pain, huh? Well, I'll type in that talk. Well, I can type and I talk, I mean, big deal. It's just, you know, I can type and then I just picked up the microphone and talk. So I loaded the uh, pivot root module because it's a kernel loadable module. So the, uh, if I forget to do that, I just, you know, I call pivot root. And it's not in libc yet, so then the user land program um, core dumps. But uh, since I uh, loaded the module, then uh, the, the code is there and pivot root can, can run. So actually, here I have wd0, which is root, and wd1, which is the um, new root. I just it like that and I have a procfs mount because that's pretty standard so we're gonna see something happen here yeah some something else I actually do when I am um, when I was debugging this I would put a WD0 empty file there on um, WD0 and obviously on WD1 I would have one because when you switch you want to make sure am I on the right one so they're not totally identical okay so we go
So put all this in that, just that directory. And now we have uh, this situation. So you see procf, procf has followed along. That's obvious. I mean, it was on the route before, and it went along. Um, this, I can un unmount now procfs, and I'll talk about unmounting the other things. And, but my other uh, demonstration will be running on a slightly different setup, so I'm going to now reboot the, um, the VM, and we'll look at it uh, later. Hold to fix. I'm going to uh, boot into a RAM disk later on. Okay, so back to the presentation. Uh, yeah. So yes. So actually, maybe this is more important question. I mean, first of all, it has to run, right? But the second thing is, why do we want this actually? Um, we've been able to live without it for 10 years. Pivot root comes from Linux. This could be a reason why we don't have it in FreeBSD, because oh, it's Linux. But also, there was no need for it, really, uh, for a long time. So why have it? You know, it just doesn't make sense. So seven years ago, I discovered that this was called pivot root when I was doing my talk about RAM disks and so on. And, uh, but there was the init root solution that came out, and it was good enough to move into a, a different root when you were booting up. And so there was no pressure. But uh, when you work with um, embedded systems where you want to upgrade firmware, or so very often your root file system comes in the way. So it would be handy to have it. And um, large boxes take a long time to boot. But you might want to fill up, re upgrade full, the full user space, but you know the kernel won't up update. So you just um, keep the kernel the same, but everything else can uh, change. So what does actually Linux init RD do? Probably most of you know who have worked with uh, Linux, but it's the two-stage boot process. They go into an initial RAM disk, and that's why it's called init RD. And then um, that init RD looks for the root file system. It may be loading more drivers and doing other things to get to the root file system. And once that's prepared, it mounts it, and then it pivots into it. This is for most Linux users and even admins, it's totally transparent. They don't even know that, that this pivot root thing, magic happens there. But then their system is um, fin fin finished, is uh, finally booted. So at the end, you can free, of course, the uh, initial memory, the init RD memory, which we want to do as well. So on NetBSD or FreeBSD, people now would like to also encrypt their root file system with CGD or Jelly or GBD on FreeBSD, and there you need to do exactly this type of um, mechanism. You have to boot into something which has enough BSD infrastructure to, to um, de 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 decrypt the root file system, and then you can go mount it. So you generally do this with a RAM disk, and then you use the init root mechanism. So right now we could, of course, do this with pivot root. Where does this actually idea come from? It's really old. I mean, that's how all the OS installs OS install themselves. They they um, come up and they go into a RAM disk. If you're a CD-ROM, you have no writable uh, media, and you take the memory to do that. And then from there, you prepare the media you want to install your OS on with manipulating the disk, and then later on using truth to get it all down, and then you reboot into it. Now, in this case, you wouldn't have to reboot. You could just pivot root into it at the end, and the system would be running. Now, obviously, sooner or later, you will be rebooting, but um, you don't need to. And it might be good for live file systems, for example, where you just, you're never going to reboot because you don't need it at the end anyway. So this idea is not revolutionary. It's just an incremental change. The change, I think, is that you can do this any time, not only at boot time. And this is actually the firmware upgrade situation where you're doing it at the end of the lifetime of an appliance where it gets the new image. It will actually do the pivot route to do it. So how would you do an upgrade of a firmware on a, an appliance? You would um, 
have a running system, you would take its full root file system, which is or maybe some um, read-only some um, read-only root file system, which you would then put into memory on RAM disk. You would then pivot into that, so you're still running the same exact system, and this frees up the old root, which you then can do whatever the manipulation you need, and then you can do a second pivot root back into the new state. So obviously this works perfectly unless you're upgrading your kernel, which then you have to first boot to take advantage of. There's also a situation where you might just have your hard disk for some reason, software or hardware not doing what you expect and you need a new root. And you don't want to boot your system because you might lose evidence for some reason. You want to keep your system running, have the old root there to maybe fix it or investigate because once you boot, you lose all that information. So it would be nice to go to a different route, which you know is safe, an NFS server, work from there and investigate what's actually wrong before your system totally locks up. This is a, a picture from Windows support and they just say, well, you know, if you have a disk for a reboot, don't know how that's going to solve the problem, but um, there's a check disk, I think, on Windows 7, which is a bit more sophisticated, so they're selling that. It's a nice, cute uh, photo here. So that's the description of pivot root. I um, hope it's clear that this difference between init root, short root, and pivot root, and now the question is, how is this implemented? So I thought it was actually pretty easy uh, to start, but I stopped working on it. I had a version in FreeBSD which kind of worked, but it always panicked at the end, and it was, I was never, never able to remove the old root, and every time I touched the old root, the system would go haywire, and I lost interest because I just couldn't solve it. And I, I left it for a while, for actually a few years. And then when I started looking at um, NetBSD code, I said, well, let's try again. And so you have to ask yourself a few questions. How do you want to do this? Um, earlier, I just put it into VFS mount and made it a different way and hacked it a bit to see could I get it to work. But then when I was doing it with NetBSD, I wanted to also become more familiar with kernel loadable modules. So I um, said, well, can I make a new system call? Because I want to make a system call which is, that is actually Linux compatible. And I want to put it in a kernel module. So it's also a learning process for me. But later on, actually, it occurred to me, and I also saw some code from Scott Long that uh, had written something like that. Wow, that never really worked a few years back. And it was integrated into the mount um, system call, which I think is quite attractive because you don't need a, a libc bump or anything. You just, it's a different uh, type of file system. You pivot, and it's all part of uh, the mount system call. There's a drawback to that, too, though. I'll get to that later. And you have a user land stub. It's either the mount call or the mount uh, program or the pivot root program. And that program, of course, could help you do other things before or after you invoke the system call. And uh, the final question I had is, what do we do on FreeBSD jails? Because a FreeBSD jail <laughs> It may, it cannot do the pivot root per se, because it would turn the world inside out and everybody else would be underneath its own root. But you could imagine that the jail itself can do its own pivot root in its own little world. And actually, this is an attractive thing I'll talk about later on. So, what does the user land program look like? This is just the uh, important part of it. It's uh, really straightforward, totally straightforward. But one of the things that I think you have to do right away is to make sure that the input is validated so you make sure that the, uh, you can call relative paths or you call real paths so you get a nice string. This is important because these strings will eventually go into the mount list. And if you can do real path in user space, that's good. And obviously, that doesn't stop somebody from using your system call raw. But if they were asking for trouble, that's what they get. Here, if you use the user space, this will be guaranteed to have clean, clean um, path names because real path takes out all redundant slashes and dots and anything else. And then you can do some more 
plausibility checks here is feasibly underneath each other and so on. And then you call the system call. So all the work obviously is done here. One more thing that you might want to do at the end is signal the process number one. And this is now I'm coming to the additional difficulty that you will have when you do pivot root. It all seems so simple now, and I want to make it look this simple because it is quite simple, and the usage of it should be simple. But there is a, the, the problem that processes like one in it or other processes, they're still, they still have file descriptors on the old root. That doesn't really change. You'll see in the system call implementation that we can do some things for the process, but we can't do everything. So maybe in the user land program, this is just a hypothesis where you could do it this way, we could tell in it, okay, open, reopen your file descriptors on the, on the new root. Uh, kill hub, kill, yeah. Well, signal on C, kill minus one, just something that a hub signal. Hub means um, hang up, reopen your file descriptors. So now about the, um, the system call itself, the other part, the hard part. When you're doing the uh, pivot root system call, you have to contend with the uh, virtual file system um, programming structure. And this is actually the part which seems easy, but then it gets very complicated because it's all over the place and you can read the manual many times. And for me, it seems straightforward, but it's not so easy. So first of all, the root v node, it's a global variable. So you're gonna be changing that at some point that global variables in the kernel, and, and you change it uh, at the right point. Uh, you have v nodes to uh, look at. I'll tell you what the v node is later, but they are connected to the directories that you're working with. It would be new root and the output old, and of course, mount points, root mount point, the new root, and later on when you put the, uh, old, the new root, the old root on the um, put old. So these are the mount points you're continuing with. And all these, Structures that have locks and references, meaning that when you use them, you raise a reference by one, or if you drop the usage, you re re release the reference. And this has to match up, otherwise, eventually, there'll be a problem later on. You have the name of go up, which is the way the, um, the path name gets translated into a V node. There's a cache there, so you have to make sure that cache is uh, handled correctly. And then you have locks on the mount list itself because there's one big mount list, and each mount point in that list, again, has locks. And actually, once you get all this straight, you still have the problem that the running process themselves, they all have a current working directory and root directory, and since you're shifting root on them, they have to be told about this. So this is actually what we need to, to do. So uh, how will we start the uh, implementation? We first, uh, I did this several times, but uh, I thought this was the best way to do it. We first get the uh, v-node of the old root. That's where we're going to put the root uh, later on. It's actually below a new root, but this has to exist, and if it doesn't exist, we don't even uh, go on. Then we get nvp, the new um, v-node. This is all without locks, and uh, we, Oh, there is a lock. There's a lock in the beginning to go into the system call. There's a reason for it. I'll tell you later. So we only have run instance of uh, the system call running because otherwise we could create hairy race conditions. But then we get the root, uh, v, root new view node, which is above the put old, and we check to see does it all line up, meaning that the put old has to be on the new root file system. New root has to be the root of a mounted file system. And, and uh, it has to, well, if it's not under it, then we just exit invalid. Now, if the process that was calling this was um, actually not under new root, we should move there before, because otherwise we'll be, we'll be blocking ourselves. So you silently move to the new root so that you're in the root later on when you've done the call. So this is all preparation. And then uh, you, once that has all kind of been set up without any locks, you go into the mount list and uh, you start the first part. So you 
you move it to the uh, N N NMP is the mount point, and you move it to to the to the top of the list so that when somebody does mount or DF, they get the list in the right order. It's also necessary because other places expect root to be first, and you then for each of the mount points adjust the statfs which you saw happen with proc, and then uh, this is where you do the main work. And you don't adjust root B node right away because you have an interesting routine in um, NetBSD and also in FreeBSD to signal all the processes that the root file system, uh, that their mount point has changed. This is used by the mount system call to tell all processes, listen, you're, um, you may be underneath um, a file system which now is being mounted over you, so they have to move over, over on top. And the interesting thing is that routine actually changes the root v node when you call it from the top, from the root v node itself at the end. Now, there's different cases in FreeBSD uh, slash dev is a devfs so, uh, de device um, devfs, so you actually would have that moved down too, and that would be very bad because anything that would happen right after the pivot root would not find slash dev and would probably fail. So you actually do it the favor and inside the system call you also move dev back again to the new root um, node. You hook it up there. And in, previous, in NetBSD, you don't need to do this because there's no devfs. But in NetBSD, you have to um, update the current dot root variables. And this is not so easy because they're actually, well, it's obviously doable, but they're constants, they're read-only, so you probably have to delete them and, and remake them for, for the new root. That part I haven't done yet because I discovered it just recently that I want those to be correct. If somebody looks at the syscontrol variables, they better be correct because this could be misleading otherwise. So. I'm not going to go into the code further because once I commit it, and I will, we, we can then all look at it in detail. But uh, what do you have to work with uh, when you're doing VFS? You use the name I, and it's infamous, the name I. Everybody wants to make it better and do its thing, but it's complicated. But the nice thing is in NetBSD, we have the name I simple kernel and the name I simple user, which are actually they do most of the work that NameI does for the most common cases. So kernel means that you take paths that are from kernel space and translate them into B nodes. And in, uh, if you have user space data, when the system call gets started, of course, it's user space data. You get a V node and you copy the user space data into kernel space and then get the V node of new root and put old. So once you have that, either through the ND init NameI or through that interface, you then um, can reference them with, you change references by calling vref, or you release reference by counting down with vrelay. So these are inverse operations. You can lock a vnote. If you need to change things, you have to lock it. You can decide to lock it immediately when you're doing the name I call. So it's in, inside the name I call with a flag, you lock it. Or you um, can lock it explicitly with vn lock. And obviously, when you're filling with the V node, you have to lock it. But I saw that it was much better to actually lock towards after all the validation because you don't want to accept, um, you don't want to lock against yourself. If somebody gives you two V nodes on the same file system, you could lock against your own uh, root file system, which then, of course, makes the kernel hang. So you do it unlock when you do the validation to make sure that the V nodes are underneath each other, and then you get the locks to do the work. And then uh, the mount list locks are, are mutexes. This is for the whole list once, and this is for each mount point. And this actually is the magic sauce. When you call this, after you've set up all the right things, you call mount check deers with root B node. And it realizes that you've set this up, that root B node is actually mounted on new root. And at the end of telling all the processes that listen to your current working directory and the root directory has changed, it will then actually change root B node to new root for you. 
And this part actually is in VFS Mount C already, and it has the, the correct locks. It works uh, very nice, because in a, may, in a way, you are mounting root once more somewhere else. So when you're doing this, how do you debug all this? I had to, I just couldn't write down the code and make it work, obviously. So I had to do debugging. And uh, on NetBSD, I found some nice um, routines that do this for you. So you get output like this. And you stare at it and stare at it and try to find out, well, the reference is there. Important. They go up, they go down. And uh, if, if you do it the wrong way, you have, uh, you, you then have a, either a hang or a panic later on, maybe much later on. That's the interesting thing. Then you need to look at the flags because you will be changing these. And uh, if you're mounted, you have, you're holding uh, the Reno as well. And you may have locks, so you see that uh, there's a lock and this is a V node, which then you can match up with another media you're, you're watching. So by looking at this debug as you're doing the pivot route, you, um, you see what's happening and you see what you need to do to make it really work. And mount points very similar because obviously they interact with each other. Mount points um, cover V nodes and then you see which V node is being covered by the other. You can see the flag if it's, if it's the root file system or something else or where is it mounted. And um, also the status information which is down below, you see what the paths are, which of course you're changing as you go through the mount list. So these two routines are actually already there. You just have to print them out in the right place. And you obviously have to look at the different uh, Venos, and they're obviously pointing to each other because it's all forward and back linked lists. So you can find out where your Vnode is actually mounted because the Vnode may be down somewhere, but it's mounted up on a on root or a newer. Uh, you know it may have a mount point, yes. And then if it's the mount point's there, you have to, it may be covered, so you have to look at this, which we of course modify. And then in certain cases you then have to follow right through. And I look at all these to get the references and locks correct. So what things can go wrong? Well I I thought I was good at security and I had code which kind of was working for a long time, and I didn't think about, well, if I let somebody do pivot root out of a true environment, this is going to let him see everything, and everybody else will see nothing. So that's actually very bad. So the first thing that the system call does is checks to see, am I being called from a true true environment? And if so, be perm. But this was not in there for a long time, so it would have been a gaping hole. Um, when you were validating input, I first was using locks, and then in certain situations where I would give it um, uh, mount points, and new, mount, new root was on the same file system, it would lock it, so the system would freeze. And then I would have to go into the debugger and find out, why is it doing that? Oh, it makes sense. And, and so on. And there's also a problem with when you're taking two VNodes, and you, you, um, you shouldn't lock two VNodes uh, at the same time, because this opens you to a potential race because you're trying to get one and another system call or somebody, somebody else is getting the other one and you're, you're, uh, you're, you're deadlocked. So I haven't found a way to say, get this solved completely, but since I'm breaking the rules in pivot root, I make a lock around pivot root and I also have the lock on the mount list and I try to keep that area very short, but I need to have both the put old and the old root locked at the same time to, to flip the um, certain values. Can't do it one after the other. I may be able to fix that still, but to me it seems I, I, I need to have both locks at the same time because I'm getting a value which I then put in the other one. And okay, phenomenally what happens, phenomen when you look at your system after you've run a buggy pivot route, a few things can, can happen, for example, it may seem to have worked, but um, you panic when you reboot, which means that some reference has not been counted down correctly, and it, it will tell you when it reboots, oh, I couldn't even unmount this thing, it's too many references, and then it panics while it's shutting down. So that means there's a problem in your code, and it's latent there, but it doesn't really seem like there's a problem until you do the reboot. 
or obviously, uh, if you access the old root under the put old, it may lock up your system. I had that too, because you uh, you've left uh, you've um, left the reference too much, and and, and then you see it, it just it locks on you. So this actually then shows you how complicated VFS can get if you try to uh, fiddle with it. Uh, I talked about the, the processes which run on, um, they get moved, their current working directory, but their file descriptors, of course, the processes have to contend that with themselves. I mean, there's no way for a secure shell daemon to, to know what to open on the other side. So you have to restart these services. So uh, that's something that actually the administrator is left to do. He only has the possibility to work with put old and make sure that all the processes remove their references on the old um, file system. So that's how much I've done till now. And I'm, this is what I tend to do. I'm still not so sure if all the code, it's very, not very much code actually, it's one or two um, subroutines that I could actually put into the mount, EFS mount code and just support the minus T pivot option. But the drawback is that then it would always be in the kernel and making a sys control, turning it on and off, I mean, that's just added aggravation for a root to have to do because uh, either you lock it out and then you have to reboot anyway, which, which you were, is kind of pointless because that you were trying to avoid to do that. And um, if you make a kernel module, then of course it's isolated. It doesn't, your kernel proper doesn't have this but anybody can load it, right? So I have this right now, which means I, it's easy to do this. It's probably harder to do this than this. It's better to isolate from the rest of the tree. Then once that's done, uh, obviously it's nice to support the pivot root system call. So we would, uh, you would have it in the system calls that we have the compatibility library, and we would just have the little shim to also support that. And uh, I still need to update this, these uh, persistent uh, variables. And when I have running code for NetBSD, but I do plan to do it also for FreeBSD or with some help from FreeBSD people, and then this last step has to be done. But this is actually the easy part because it's just moving one, one thing, it's straightforward. And uh, in NetBSD, you could ask, well, should, should the kernel also look at, is there a dev PTS, and if so, move it over, because there may be network connections and so on, but uh, I'm not so sure. I'm gonna have to discuss this on the mailing list if we want to do this. I think it's the Unix philosophy is to do as little as necessary and let other programs uh, put them together, these small primitives put them together to make the complete uh, solution. So I'm gonna show you another demo a bit longer. Yeah, I have enough time. Um, and what is it? It's actually a very large NetBSD kernel, 23 megabytes. I didn't compress it, didn't strip it, nothing. And it, uh, it's a generic install kernel, uh, current head. And um, it has an 8 megabyte RAM disk built in. It's a custom RAM disk with a secure shell daemon running in a root file, in a root home directory, and SSH, and authorized key. So I can log into the system from the outside. I'll show you this. So it's, I'm in the RAM disk. And then I will, well, pivot root came out, it's already loaded, and, or I could load it. And then I will switch, like I did before. And then I will restart all the processes to, in fact, get rid of all those file descriptions still hanging off my RAM disk this time, because this is my root. And then I unmount the RAM disk, and you will see that my system's still running, and I can still log in from the outside. So this is a way, this demo is showing you step by step the init RD of Linux, I mean, 10 years later. <laughs> but uh, it's instructive, and it also shows you that it works. And I'll just now drive this through, and then later on we can maybe do some questions. We probably do one question now. Reason being that when I boot this thing into the RAM disk, it, you will see it will take a very long time. 
Well, a very long time. It's, I think it takes about 30 seconds. Um, because uh, NetBSD, when it boots and it discovers that slash def is empty, the dev console is missing, it, uh, it says, oh, I have to make the dev file system. So it, it makes the dev. It uses shell make dev. It makes all the devices. And that takes a long time. Because, I mean, this is a virtual machine, so it's not fast. And uh, eventually we'll see it making these devices. And that unfortunately takes some time. So you can't really see it, but you know, it's, it's all green until it discovers the root file system on, on NetBSD. And then it's doing this thing, which takes 30 seconds. And then once it's done, I can then log in. And also in VirtualBox, when uh, you log in with a, uh, when you start with a different DHCP setup, it, it changes the IP. So it's not 101 anymore, it's um, 14. And I'm gonna have to log in as root here because I only have root on my RAM disk. And I have a secure shell secret key, so I, I don't need to type a password. So um, did something happen back here? Yes, uh, it's finished. It starts its secure shell daemon, blah, blah, blah. It uh, actually loads the pivot root came out, because if I forget, I get cordon that's kind of ugly in a demo. So it should be listening here, and I can then log in. Yeah, first time. Ah, yeah, well, actually, I shouldn't do this. I have this uh, thing called ish, which <laughs> it's a stupid little program. It actually just doesn't store the secure shell keys. And because you know, if it's a one-time thing, you don't want them stored in your known host because it will uh, it'll just pollute it. So uh, ish, it doesn't do that. So see, I got in without uh, answering the stupid question. So I'm in the RAM disk here. Root is quite full, 99%. But I have a nice selection of uh, programs here. It's crunched, of course, so, whoops. Yeah, typing with one hand and then term caps a bit bad. Then, all right, so there's 116 commands that are all crunched together here. It's very similar to rescue, but a few have thrown out and a few have put in to have the, the networking part in. And um, it's all crunched into one program, obviously. And um, pivot roots crunched in there, too. So now we have, we have the MFS, this 8 megabyte thing. And we have, uh, well, there's nothing here yet, because uh, it's all in memory. And now we mount the um, device W0A, the one that we looked at before. You know, the slash is missing. So we, excuse me? Yep, good hint. It's as far up as it can go. All right, so. I didn't practice with uh, one hand. Okay, um. Yeah, no one, just A. I'm getting used to the previous key. <laughs> mount, device, W, Z, zero, A, on mount. There we go. Okay, finally. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hold up plus. <laughs> Sorry, so this is the route we had before. Two-handed works better. And we pivot into it. So, so now that's what we expected. But actually, I, sh uh, I should have showed you the PS, the which processes we're running, because we have to now take care of these. So um, yeah. Uh, what, what do I do now? I Actually, this is the last command I'm going to type in. I'm going to start etcrc. This is what actually init would do. <laughs> 
And the funny thing is, actually, it's reconfiguring this uh, network again, obviously, because it was the system with the config in rcconf. And, um, but I get to keep the, this is a network connection, obviously. So I get to keep, um, keep that network connection. And now I could actually go and, this, of course, will fail because I can't check root. It's a rewrite, but that doesn't uh, bother me. But now I have all the stuff already running in the new root. And I could now uh, unmount the old stuff. But I'm not going to show you this. So we're done. And maybe it's actually time for one smart question, maybe. <laughs> and then we can go to lunch. So. Right. I'm intrigued about the possibilities of the Linux emulation of doing the, the this is called. Can you think of a use case? Well, intrigued. The thing is, we have a list of uh, syscalls that we can emulate with uh, changing a few arguments or something to make them work the same way. Now, I don't think there's a large use case because uh, Linux, why would you be running um, pivot root on a Linux application? This is uh, operating system infrastructure. But since we have pivot, we would have pivot root, we also put it into the, system, into the uh, compatible library just because we, we have it. Not because we expect an application to actually use it. And if it would use it, it would, it would not fail. It would work. So I agree with you. There is really no real use case because if you're doing pivot root, you're probably use, you're doing running Linux anyway. I had a question. Uh, um, myself, uh, <laughs> and I don't have an answer to it, but we have a very cool uh, testing uh, environment on NetBSD. And I, I don't know how we're going to test this, though, because when you test pivot root, you're changing everything, and the whole test, uh, automa test automation will then, of course, start failing because it's in the wrong root. So I don't really know how we would test that. With a FreeBSD gel, it would be easier because you put it in a gel, and it would do it in that level, and you could look at it from the outside. So, what? Yeah, but still, you're changing the root. Yes, but inside one, that's smart. But how would your Anita test suite then continue in the new root? Okay, so the basic idea is you can use uh, WAMP to uh, one user land kernel, yes. and you could uh, mount uh, some ah, hard system okay, in okay. it. You can yes. also bind additional uh, processes to it to a degree, and then you can do the um, pivot to it yes. and test that. Okay, so the missing link is having the kernel running in, uh, on the RUMP. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, the good, that's actually a very good point. So I have a way to test it. I have no excuse. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, otherwise, you know, feel free to come and ask me questions some other time. And uh, have a good lunch.